I mean, interrupt me anytime if you think of a question. You know, my background, by the way, is uh, Missouri is my home state. I grew up here. Jackson, anybody from southeast Missouri down in that part of the state? Anyway, Jackson, Missouri is near Cape Girardeau. Maybe you've heard of that. That's where I grew up, you know, went to high school, graduated. SEMO for college, and I came here for grad school. So my roots to MU go back a ways. Uh, I directly moved from here to Houston, Texas, and never thinking that, I have to say, a few decades later, I moved straight back. Uh, so it's been great being back. And Steve and I were both fortunate, we met down there, but we were both fortunate to work for NASA and have some shuttle flights. And I did EVAs, uh, extravehicular activity or spacewalking, on the last two flights. I had four flights. The last two I got to do one spacewalk each. So I mean, it was a really neat thing to have been done. I mean, we had some really heavy intensive missions, particularly building the space station. It was so EVA intensive that there were some naysayers at the beginning that said, you'll never make, you know, just reliability of suits and, and just the endless hours of EVA, there'll be issues, you'll never get it done. But I will have to say that all the hours of EVA that went into building the space station, there were relatively few issues, if at all. So it says a lot about the suit. And there were a lot of engineers I know that had their hands on the design and building of that suit. I'm sure a lot of mechanical engineers and electrical and, you know, even, even others. And so it really is an amazing thing. This picture um, is during training. And we did a lot of training, um, generic training and then mission specific uh, in big water tanks. I have a picture coming up. And over my tenure at NASA, we went from one water tank that had been there a long time to an even larger one. Uh, so I suppose I have a, you know, a few hundred hours of being underwater in that. And, and I think, um, and a lot of engineers working to support that as well. And probably <coughs> it's almost as challenging to keep up these suits that, oh, I lost the battery in there, but that were fairly constantly immersed in water. You know, that's just as challenging to keep these training suits going as almost the ones that went to space. But this is the kind of gear we'd wear going into the water to train. And it's kind of different because all these little flat things aren't there in space. This is where they put weights. One of the first things we do when we get in the water is there are divers that come up and try to make us neutrally buoyant and fairly stable in some position. Because uh, otherwise you're fi constantly fighting a sinking or a rising thing, depending on the buoyancy of the suit. And you might think this thing is pretty heavy. I don't know what the, the water tank version weighs. In space, with a human being in it, these suits are probably around 500 and 550 pound mass. There's no real weight, it's just mass, which would be, I guess, 230 or 240 kilograms or something. Um, so they're, they're almost probably that heavy. They don't have the full life support backpack. But you can see, you would think that would sink, but it's a big enough volume that, of course, with buoyancy, it actually tends to maybe sometimes want to rise. So they have to put weights in it. But we would get all suited up with the gloves and everything. You can see the neck ring is still here, waiting for the helmet, the cob cap. And all my later training when the glasses appeared. They weren't there when I first started doing it, but I showed up later. And actually, it got worse in the water because the diopters, and whatever you measure vision with, when you get underwater, water makes things look different. And it was harder to read the checklist underwater than it was. Uh, so if your eyes kind of just started going the near vision south at all, it was worse in the water. But that. We'd suit up like that. And this actually is myself and Dan Tani. My last, I'm talking mostly here about my last mission, which was in um, December of 2001, where we did a spacewalk. So we were training for that. And you can get an idea of the size of the facility here. Test control rooms up at the top. Many divers in the water, some to assist the crew, some for filming. Um, and we were on long umbilicals rather than real uh, life support backpacks. So there'd be divers constantly making sure those didn't get twisted and snarled and kinked because you definitely wanted the, uh, not just the cooling to keep flowing, but the air it was very important. <laughs> wanted to keep the air flowing. Uh, so they could get all suited up and they would, you know, finally put the helmet on last and get on, you know, where we're just basically living off the inside of the suit, except it's not self-contained. Again, it had umbilicals. And for most of the, the training I did, we'd disappear underwater here. We wouldn't emerge for six hours. We'd be under there for about six hours working at a time. And there'd be people up here in the control test area saying, well, we're sending somebody out for lunch. We're going to be having some sandwiches up here. And we're <laughs> getting hungry. And we would go with only one drink bag, and that's it, a drink bag of water. But that water was really good. You know, if you're getting kind of tired and, you know, a little hot, and the water's better than anything anyway. So that's how they did the training. They still do the training. And submerged in that water would be various test setups that would mimic the on-orbit you know, configuration that you're going to do for that mission. So 
for the life of the shuttle program, I guess they don't have this there now, there'd be a shuttle mock-up at one end and different segments of space station at the other end. And sometimes we couldn't do the true, two transla the true translation, that's where the divers would come in and swim us over to the next space, because you couldn't put the whole thing in there and we'd say, wish we could take those guys along. So that was pretty good. Um, so this is flipping to on orbit, switching on orbit, and this is my crewmate Dan Tani. He and I did the spacewalk together. So he's starting to don part of the same hardware, except now it's flag hardware. He's got on the lower torso assembly, assembly there's still a the waist ring exposed. And all this stuff he has on with some of this tubing you can see that's just to run water through the undergarment to keep cool. You might think it'd be cold in space, but, and it is certainly, except when you're in direct sunlight. And then also that suit has got a lot of layers, 14 layers of stuff, it's well insulated. So just like even when you dress up for the winter, if you start to exert yourself, you start to feel too hot. And it's very easy to get too hot. And while it, you might feel uncomfortable to be cold, if you're working, it's better to be a little cool than a little too hot. It's just very uncomfortable to get like that. So we can adjust even how much water flows through those little tubes and, and do that. And they're working with some tools here that will be attached to the suit. This one um, has what we call a bayonet fitting. You can see a lot of mechanics here. Uh, you know, that would fit into uh, something that goes on the front of this, that's on the suit. And then this end, had this little thing that could open and close and it would grip handrails. So it was a good way to stabilize. So that, that would be a long, kind of a personal rigid tether to use to stabilize on a, on a handrail or something. So you get a little look there too at the inside of the shuttle. It's what we call the mid-deck. It was the inner part of the cockpit nose with the crew lift. So the inner part and actually that's the entry hatch there. It's hard to see that's even a hatch, but it's back there. And tucked behind this little door, just for future reference, was our waste control system was the bathroom, so that was through there. Flight deck was up on top, and the way to go into the airlock, where if you turn one way, you go into space station, because we were docked and connected with them. Another way to go outside would be right through that opening. So it's kind of interesting to look at it. You know, this is, if you've ever been anywhere, you've been inside a shuttle mock-up, you generally don't see it looking so crowded with just stowage bags everywhere, like here and here and here, and all the stuff around. Um, so kind of interesting. Any comments or questions? Just pipe up. So, all right. On this, this one, Dan and I. This is me, person with glasses. Uh, we're here. We're all suited up and ready to go. Uh, Don Gorey, who was our commander, uh, was responsible for putting it all together. We, they tried to make it so if you wanted to, you could suit yourself up yourself. It'd be very, very difficult, kind of, to do it. But. Um, he was actually in charge of doing it, and it's the best way to make sure that there's nothing caught in any of the seals. The only seals we had to make there, because the rest of the suit was already pre-assembled, was just the waist and the wrists and the neck. And we would do pressure checks and things, you know, pump down the airlock. Actually, there you don't have to pump it down so much as just open a valve to space. <laughs> it just kind of leads down, and then we had to replenish the air. Um, we would do pressure checks like that to make sure there's no leaks, no stop it, and do leak checks. So it's, as you might imagine, a very careful process, but one that we've done many, many times, and again, never a major issue with anything. And this is a wrist mirror. You can tell it looks a little shiny. It's not really glass. It's because we would take something that could shatter or break, but it's polished, something probably aluminum, but a very light metal. Uh, and that was to look at, if we wanted to look at what we were doing here on the front of this part that had controls for communication and um, temperature control, and also just different settings for the suit so we know it's supposed to live off an umbilical while we're still in the airlock or transition to being on its own. So we controlled all that with controls here. So if you want to see what they were, you know, the mirror was very handy for that. And ready to go out. This takes a few hours to get to this point. Yeah. Uh, how long would, would your air supply last off of the um, At least six hours. It really depends on the breathing and respiration rate. But we have people that could be out that long, but if they, and I can't, I think at least sometimes we had some people that could come back in and recharge because if you were came back into the airlock, there's a connection down here that the umbilical could go back on and could actually do some recharging uh, for the air. And at the end of a spacewalk, part of that cleanup procedure was to put the suits on a recharge uh, procedure so that they would refill and do things so we could use them again. But it contains a pretty good air supply, and there is a backup air supply that would not be accessed unless 
unless somebody needed it, that should last several minutes, maybe even 30 minutes. So there's always kind of at least one backup there. And part of that's to feed a leak, maybe, too, because uh, the air supply is monitored by the crew would get an alarm message. There's a small display on this thing in front, and also mission control could look at all the data, the suit data, and say, you know, here's how your levels are doing, uh, here's our predictions, um, you know, or if they saw a leak or something, they could help alert us. So I don't think we ever had any leaks that I can really think of. Do you remember any, Steve? I don't. Again, it did, the suit performed really well. They still have these on space station, of course. So this is one of our outside shots. And the only way I know this is me is I had the red stripes on. And it's a little hard to orient this picture, but this whole area would be the shuttle cargo bay. This is the sill along one side. You're actually looking back at the tail uh, section of the shuttle there. And this little wire is a slide wire where we always kept our tether connected to that. Uh, and then the tether would play out or reel in, except we were getting ready to get on the end of the shuttle or body guard, which you can't see. It would be connected all the way up here at this forward end, and we would tether ourselves to this and be really sure that was a good connection, and then reach over and disconnect from the slide wire. So one thing about going outside, tether protocol was really, really big, because um, you just want to stay connected to something. And it's, I don't think we ever had any issues with that with anybody. We did wear a uh, little small backpack, not the ones you may have seen in pictures that still float around where it was a major, the major man maneuvering unit, but it was a little backpack that, that fit around our life support unit and we had a hand controller we could get to and if we ever did find ourselves separated, the idea would be to bring that up and fire some jets to get back. It was compressed nitrogen gas. And the only way we ever practiced for that in a virtual reality lab that was kind of neat. We'd actually go put on goggles and gloves and uh, see a scene. And they, they always started it by having some of it that would thrust us like way out at some high velocity, which I would hopefully think nobody would ever do, unless you pushed off real hard in your tether rope. But, and then we'd have to try to fly back. And the only tricky thing, there's only so much nitrogen gas. And if you're in close, it's relatively easy because it's just you know in, out, left, right, up, and down. But if you get too far away, orbital dynamics take over. And then, you know, when you try to go one way, you actually just change your orbit. You know, it gets into very tricky things. So you definitely <coughs> wanted to stay close or very embarrassingly in the sand, but rapidly run out of fuel. So I'm going to take too long here. Anyway, just another shot on the same, uh, same shuttle arm. Did you ever see any debris up there, or was it just completely blank? Um. Yeah, we would see, you mean, just around, floating around the shuttle? Yeah, just like dust? Or yeah, the only thing that, they would tend to orbit with the shuttle because it was all at the same velocity. And Steve can probably confirm this, but almost every time you open the payload bay doors, you'd see little flecks of things point out. Even if it was just paint chips or just something that might not have been cleaned up, but tiny things. And they weren't hazardous to the shuttle because it was all in the same orbit. And if anything were to come whizzing by, that, you know, would hit us before we saw it. So one of the only things we would see would be things that basically were with us. Um, this, will, this will loop again in a minute. This is not a very high resolution, but it's just a little segment out of our flight movie. Shows us coming out of the airlock there, and this is an inside view. And people always say, gosh, that hatch looks really flimsy, but that's because that's the outer thermal cover. We already opened the real hatch. And getting out of anything there or moving around, body position is really tricky because it's a lot of mass. And so we're all falling around the Earth in a free fall orbit, so there's no effects that feel like weight. But just to reorient that much mass, um, much easier there than in the water tank with the water drag. But if you got something started, it was hard to stop it. Because again, you got all the mass, so the momentum really, or angular momentum really played. Uh, I always like to say it's really physics played out. You know, because all of the F equals <coughs> MA is just evident everywhere, and the torque and things that you would do. So anyway, it was just, but I remember the first time I went out the airlock on, on my third flight and looked around and thought it, it oddly feels kind of familiar. And I attributed that just to the fidelity, the training, the, the shuttle bay mocked up in the water tank and the hours we spent doing that and being in the suit. Um, and just one shot where I'm trying to say, if you look real close, that really is me. There's a glare, but uh, I'm in that picture. So that's my space shot. And that's a solar uh, space station solar array in the background there. And this is just kind of a neat shot. This is, we had to leave the shuttle cargo bay and the robotic arm 
dropped us off. Uh, you can see the end of it right here. Um, it's up here. This is the end effector. And we, we climbed off there and got onto this structure, onto a different slide wire. And it's kind of hard to pick out the people because everything's so white. But um, there's the two of us. I think this is me. I'm not sure. I think I see a stripe. Anyway, I'm one of those two people. And we're making our ways out to these beta gimbal assemblies. And these are the things that oriented the solar uh, panels. And you can see that one's oriented a little different than the one down here. And there are many more of these on station now than when I was there doing this. But these things had to rotate. And they were having some thermal issues as they orbited the Earth and got night dark day-night cycles. So we were there to put on some thermal coverings. We weren't there to actually add to space station. That wasn't our job. We did that, and we had some other tasks we did, and came back in. This EVA was less than six hours. It was probably closer to five hours or a little less. So there were definitely more marathon EVAs than this that went on. But uh, just very interesting to be out and working. One thing I remember here that was so weird, we had in the water tank where we practiced on the ground, that big tank, we didn't have the solar panels there, but we had things that kind of looked like this truss and this assembly and that assembly. And we would practice putting these thermal covers on them many times in the water, which had its own frustrations because the drag of the water would hinder that, actually. And one of them would always feel, you know, I feel, oh, this is easy, I'm upright. Then we'd have to turn it upside down to do this one in the water, which is always more uncomfortable. And the really weird thing was, on this flight, we went to do this assembly, it felt, I felt upside down when I was doing it, and I couldn't shake that sense. I mean, it was all in my head because there was nothing to make me feel upside down. But I could not shake the upside down feeling I had the whole time I was doing that. And that's just some neurological odd thing um, that I did. So it was, that was always kind of funny to me that, that, that flip, I couldn't flip it in my head. Um, but it was fun you know, to get to do some translation and, and actually had to remind ourselves to stop and look at the earth in the background because uh, as we do these spacewalks, by the way, you know, uh, it's a day-night cycle. It's not like we do it all in daylight. So the shuttle orbits the earth in about 90 minutes in space station, or it did. So there's 16 sunrises and sunsets in that time. So every 45 minutes, roughly, kind of depends you know, on where the Terminator is and everything that time of year, but or the, the angle. Um, we get a, we get a day night cycle, so it was constantly you know working in the daylight and then going dark, and so we had helmet lights we could turn on, and so that was kind of strange. And then pretty soon the sun would come up again, and then pretty soon the sun would set again, and <laughs> just different. I could definitely tell the difference in temperature though too. It'd feel much warmer when the sun was up, and it was kind of a pain to reach down and change the temperature. So I just decided I'd go with being a little chilly in the daytime. I mean in the nighttime and very comfortable in the daytime. So that was my compromise on that. This is the display that I talked about that uh, we is on the front here. So this little panel right up there, um, this is a what it really looks like. You'll notice everything is written, not the little uh, labels here, but if you look at everything here, it's not very hi-fi. But if you look at this and this, they're all backwards, and so that was for the use of the mirror looking at it. This, by the way, this was the, the cooling. So I had to re we had to actually drop our tool caddy in front down and reach in and twist that to change the temperature and then bring the tool caddy back up. So that's why I usually just left that on something. And so and then we could change volume controls for the calm and um, do different things. And these are all the mini layers. So there's about 14 layers in this suit. I actually covered that up. I should have brought this to the forward. But it's just, it's a variety of things. You know, there's one for thermal, there's micrometeoroid protection. Um, there's something to give it a little bit of shape. It's neoprene coated uh, nylon ripstop. There's a lot of words in there. Uh, there's a lot of nylon, there's dacron, there's just different things. Uh, the very bottom parts, the liquid cooling and ventilation garment with the tubing. So it's all in all, it's about a 14 layer suit that's built up. And the interesting thing is when they designed this suit, it has to be a cost, constant volume suit because you don't want to be bending like a balloon, you know, where you're trying to, as you change the shape of something, normally the pressure changes because you're changing the volume. So they had to build all these joints, you know, whether it's the elbow or the shoulder or anything, uh, so that when it, as it bends, it keeps the whole suit a constant volume. So that's one of the design challenges because otherwise you'd be expending energy compressing this. It's already kind of stiff to move. 
But you don't want to be trying to change the pressure of the suit just by the fact you're bending a limb. So somehow with all those joints, they have to move to maintain a constant volume, which maintains a constant pressure. So again, we, we built them up over the years. They weren't always, you know, um, there's still improvements to be made. They weren't always as good. And I'm going to end here with for questions because I don't want to take up too much time. But I found this clip. I thought it was kind of interesting. The very first uh, EVA we did, I'm going to speed this up a bit, was on Gemini 4 with Ed White. And Ed White, we later lost in the Apollo fire. And that, and so, where is this? There's this picture here where he's getting out. And then, wait, this was our very first EVA we did, and the Russians had already done one, and it turned out uh, they had had some issues, but they didn't talk about it. That was the Soviets back in those days. So they had to depress the whole Gemini capsule. I mean, they didn't have an airlock. So the guy inside was in a suit, too. It was Jim McDivitt. And he just kind of launched out into space, basically. And he had this little thing, you'll see him holding it, that he, he fired some thrusters. I assume maybe this was compressed nitrogen, but I'm actually not sure. And he had no way to control his attitude out there at all. Um, so here's the Gemini spacecraft. There he goes. He's got this thing he's holding, but you might notice the way he's holding that, it's probably not at the CG. So you're gonna hear, he's probably torquing himself, you know, different, he's applying a torque every time he fires the jets. What actually happened, they had no, they didn't do any water tank training. There was really no training for this at all other than being in the suit and practicing, you know, using the suit. And the stories we've already always heard since then is he had a terrible time getting back in. I mean, they weren't sure. If they couldn't get him back in, they would have had to cut him loose so they could close the hatch to get the other guy home. But it was a fairly serious thing, but he made it back in and today they lost the thermal glove uh, floating out. That eventually comes in, by the way, because we're this is low Earth orbit. There's still atoms and molecules of air, so eventually it slows down and comes back in and burns up. Low Earth orbit is a cleaner orbit in general than high orbits um, because it cleans itself out. So anyway, you can see that he was not under great control there, uh, but they did get him back in. This was our first experience at EVA, and they had to do this because by the time they were doing this, we'd already said we're going to the moon. So, you know, they had to learn this whole EVA thing. They had to learn rendezvous. Jim and I did all of that in the space program. So we learned from that, too, I would say, on the suits that we have in the shuttle, the ones they still have on the space station, and, you know, the ones they may develop for other exploration. Um, they're very costly to do, so that kind of limits how much for, you know, new technology they can do. But we've had people at Johnson Space Center for a long time working on next generation and trying to do new stuff. So. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the micrometeoroid protection. Do you know what it was rated for? Like what it was Small supposed Small things, to? I would say. Because I mean, yeah. it's like it's miles per second that these things would hit you, right? Right. Yeah. And you'd, you'd really be hit by things that are in an elliptical orbit that you happen to intersect with. Because anything that's in your orbit will be going the same speed. Right. Um, or maybe a crossing orbit if you mm -hmm. happen to have just the bad luck to have that. And it would be going fast, but they're thinking basically small stuff. Uh, and even the shuttle only got hit with small stuff. We got window dings <clears throat> on a lot of missions where they had to trade them out. Never broke a window because they were multi-pane glass, mm -hmm. but it would look like a, uh, I mean, a very tiny particle and it would kind of look like what hits your windshield in a car. You just get this ding in it. Um, so there probably is a, st a statistic somewhere or a, or a requirement for the size, but I, the real requirement that the suit had to meet was a leak of a certain rate. And I honestly don't mm -hmm. remember what that rate was, but you had to be able to feed the leak for enough time to get back into the airlock. But everybody knew if you got if you got a really big hole, you weren't feeding that leak. So right. there was probably a limit to what the suit could do anyway. But, I, but generally, we were worried about small particles. Um, and it'd be a really big, you know, bad day if you got something like this. But the really big stuff is always tracked mm -hmm. by, the, by the military. But the little stuff doesn't get tracked. So the big sky theory is kind of like the big space <laughs> Theory a little bit, you hope you don't get it. And again, low Earth orbit cleans itself out better than high Earth orbit because there's some drag there. Yeah, definitely a concern. Yes. What were your communications like? There are systems like in the suit, and were they all wireless, or did you have a way to patch into the communication system? We were wireless to the shuttle, and mm -hmm. uh, the shuttle they transmitted to the ground, and the suit was a UHF frequency. And we all, we were always in calm. And, and the mission control could hear us almost all the time through TDRS. So, but yeah, the suit was a wireless. Mm -hmm. 
communication back to the shuttle. Uh, it would be very strange not to be able to talk to anybody <laughs> out there. Yeah. Um, as complicated as these suits are, I assume they come with a very high price tag. You bet you had some dollars. Yeah, I, and I, I asked somebody, I asked one of the EVA program managers once before I left NASA, uh, and it's one of these things that's a little difficult to price because they probably bought different parts of it at one time, and if you went to go replace it, it would be more, but I mean, it'd be multiple millions. I don't, I don't really know even how to put a price on it. Many, many millions per suit. <laughs> It's by far the most expensive thing I've ever worn. Uh, <laughs> you have limited, you know, and it's not mine anyway, but you can't wear it everywhere. <laughs> no, they are, they are very pricey. There's so much, there's so much hands-on individual work with it, individual work. And until we got to the shuttle program, everybody had their own suit. For Apollo and earlier, every astronaut had his, because it was only his then, uh, they would have, I think, a, a training suit and a flight suit and a backup, and they were fit for them. I mean, they were made to fit their body. And the shuttle, when the shuttle era began, these things were modular, so you could resize the legs. Particularly later on, they became easier to resize, but you could resize the length of the legs, the arm. They had different torso sizes that could be locked in. Not that many, like two or three different sizes. For example, on me, since I'm not a wide-shouldered guy, the shoulder uh, joints hit me about right here. Mm -hmm. So there went, you know, a few inches, a couple inches of reach on each side. But on the other hand, I was more comfortable in it because I didn't feel like I was shoehorned in it like some people did. Um, but we only had, we, they started out with three torso sizes and ended up with only two in the program. Um, and then they, the gloves, there were more glove sizes, but even those weren't individual. Some people had to get custom made gloves just because their hands were so oddly. Uh, the gloves had to fit pretty well to be able to work. And we had one person who, uh, I don't remember if he was training on the ground or he came back from a space, space flight, but he lost most of his fingernails from the pressure and the suit gloves when he came back. So it's really important to get a good, and if you can't get fingertips down into the gloves, it was very hard to work. So you can imagine if you like to work on stuff, you know, your car or whatever, and you're in bulky gloves, it's kind of like that. Uh, another, like, big issue that's, like, say, a concern for, like, a Mars mission is radiation and solar flares. Yeah. Do you know of any developments in suit technology that would that's in the works to protect against that? I don't. I think you try not to send people out. Well, you would know of a big event because we get the radiation before the particles mm -hmm. hit. Uh, what they do on space station, which uh, they would not have somebody on EVA, and they've made some safe haven calls on space station, and they have certain places to go that are safer because of what's between them. Water is one good mediator, I think, for that. So if you, were design, if you were to design a trip to Mars, you maybe might want to think where you put the water tanks or something in a spacesuit. I'm not, uh, unless, you know, materials design may have come farther than I think, but you're not going to put anything in that's bulky or big because I just won't work on the suit. You'd have to have something that itself is just highly impervious to things like half particles and, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, electrons and stuff like that. So. I don't know of anything in suit design for that. You just would have enough of a warning of a major event you just get back inside and not go out in the first place. And we also kind of worried about the South Atlantic anomaly a little bit because that's where you don't get quite as much protection from radiation. And every crew member, including wearing it out on a spacewalk, wore a radiation monitor that was assessed and measured at the end of the flight just to oh. say, did you get a big dose or something? Okay. We worry about it. It's a big, big deal for both mm -hmm. Mars. Exactly what kind of qualifications do you have that made you top candidate for being an astronaut? I never quite figured it out. <laughs> no, uh, the basic qualifications were and still are a degree in some field of math or science or engineering or medicine. It has to be a technical degree. A PhD is, is kind of required to be competitive uh, the, for civilians. I would say for the military astronauts, you know, it was uh, a lot of military experience or an advanced degree or test pilot school and things like that. So for me, it was being here, getting a PhD in physics at the time NASA announced they were hiring the first astronaut class that for the very first time was including women. Uh, that happened to be Steve's class, by the way, and I did not even get interviewed for that class. So he got selected for that class. I was here in grad school. I sent in my application. I didn't get interviewed that year. I got a little postcard or something back. <laughs> but you may find out if you go to grad school, I always thought I was about getting out. It turned out I had two more years to actually finish <laughs> before my thesis was done anyway. Uh, so I applied, NASA had another selection the year I was going to get out. I applied again, and in that interim time, I also decided 
maybe it'd be kind of, you know, be a little competitive to do something like get my pilot's license, and I did that at that time. I, they had a little strip here outside of town called um, Cottonwood Field. It doesn't exist anymore. It's where this trailer area is now for, for campus, uh, trailer park thing is for campers. Um, and I did do that, and now that I've been at NASA, I was at NASA, and I was on two or three selection boards to interview people to be astronauts, I realized they do look at things like that. So answering it from the perspective of being on a board, they're looking for people maybe who've done a little more than just being in the educational environment or academic or research. Um, they're looking for people with these advanced degrees in the right field who maybe have done something else that didn't have to be flying. Maybe, you know, like big outdoors people. Nobody ever does all of this, but I'd say on the average, you're looking to say, what else have they done that stretched themselves a little bit or maybe put themselves in a situation where you had to make some decisions that maybe weren't the most comfortable. Um, and I always thought that their biggest unknown quantity were probably the civilians, because the military people had been through certain wickets to get advanced to be where they were. Maybe had experienced, in some cases, combat or, you know, certain stressful situations, and they were better known, and they get evaluated so much, they were a better known quantity. Um, so somehow in the midst of all of that, when I applied, you know, I, went, I got invited for a, um, an interview the second time, and I went down there, really enjoyed the week, talked to people, got offered another job, though, and not the astronaut job, so it's really in the third time I got in for me. So perseverance is one qualification. <laughs> but the education background has to be there, or the door doesn't open in the first place, at least for now. I mean, maybe in the future there'll be more doors open, but yeah, I mean, engineering, probably there were more engineers there, and a lot of aero and mechanical and electrical, you know, really, more than anything else, I was going to carry the banner for physics, because I will say here, I'm not the only one in this room, but physics kind of encompasses everything to some extent, you know, and I think physics and engineering are tied together quite a bit, and in some cases, of applied physics, the boundary blurs a little bit. Um, and there were certain eyesight and health and thing qualifications like that, too, that have changed a bit over time. So part of it is just wanting to do it and applying and staying with it. But getting the education, if you don't have that up front, you're not going to get the door open. So that's really a, an important thing. What kind of applicant pool size was there? Were there a lot of people with the college? Or? Yeah, so there's usually a few thousand for every class. I think, and they just did a class. They're going to announce a class this spring. They were doing interviews last fall and into this year. It was one of the largest application groups they ever had. And, and the flight opportunities, however, have gone way down because it's only so I used a space station, so there's two flights, there's two crew handovers a year generally, and we have about two of those slots. So on the average, we have about four people flying a year now, and in the shuttle days, we might have had 20 or 30 flying a year. So that's changed quite a bit. But there's hopes that other things are going to happen. You heard about some of this in the aerospace news today. I will go through for someone who thinks, I think it's underfunded a bit, but it depends on what this country wants to do. They could decide to do more. <clears throat> Anything's better than nothing. And I'm kind of interested, and Steve may talk to you some about it, some of the commercial companies out there who are doing some really neat things right now. I'm sorry, I keep asking dumb lead questions. No, really. how, how do you guys maintain a comm link when you're orbiting that fast? I mean, do you have multiple media ports on the ground, or do you use a geosynchronous satellite to relay? Yeah, uh, well, they're not quite geo. I guess they are kind of geosynchronous. We go through TDRS, the, the shuttle comm and the space station comm goes through TDRS, we have to share that time with all the other users. So that's the tracking data, relay, satellite, and they do hope, I guess they are in geosynchronous orbit because they hover over certain places, and there's several of them in orbit, and they've got some prime and backup all the time, but they move in and out of strategic spots, so that you're never out of sight of one of them. Except we would have a small slice, because there's some overlap in coverage, just on the other side of the world from here, basically, there, there was always one little zone of exclusion that still existed that we didn't have during communication, but everything else went through the satellite. And on Space Station, they even have a satellite phone uh, that's kind of neat. And when I, my last flight when we docked with Space Station, we were just there for a few days. I was floating by it one evening. Well, evening's kind of relative from there, but it was evening back in Houston, Texas. And, um, and I saw that the light was on, that they had a good link. And it was really there for the long duration crew members, you know, to talk to family and stuff, but nobody was using it. It was an active link, so I stopped and I dialed my home phone. I don't even think Steve had a cell phone. It was <laughs> How, what were cell phones doing in 2001? They were around. But anyway, no, 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 that, was, much. Well, not much. that was the analog digital trend. Yeah, so I just dialed my home phone, and he's actually at home watching the TV coverage of it. And it's like 9 o'clock at night, and he picks up this phone saying, uh, oh, telemarketer, 
and I say, hi, it's me. <laughs> and one of the coolest you know, memories, actually, of all this high-tech mission was I got to call home. Yeah, that was kind of deep. I'm glad he answered. <laughs> and Lauren was there, too. That's our daughter, Lauren, at the back. <coughs> I would say a future engineer, but probably not. She doesn't say she doesn't like it. She has to work on it. Anything else? I know we've run a little long. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, questions? I'd be happy to come back again and talk. You know, I'm, I like what I'm doing here, but it's good to think about what Steve and I did for such a long time. I kind of like coming back and talking about it. So thank you for asking me. Uh, have fun. Thank you. Talk to you.